practice and really my thinking and uh, and that's really important. So what's really interesting about this whole idea is that the uh, of, of childhood, where to start is from the history of childhood. I often like to start from the history of childhood because that's where sort of we start thinking about what it is. And part of the key questions that we ask about childhood is that, um, what is childhood and when does childhood begin? And it may be a little bit the like, you know, question that you may say, why do you ask such a question? What does that actually mean? But we have a history of research that sort of argues that childhood is not actually something that exists in the same way for all children around the world, but childhood is actually an event that's sort of invented, that's not universal that challenges and changes across time. And it's experienced differently in Indonesia and differently in England and differently in New Zealand and differently in Australia. And Cunningham in his, in his work, he has this really interesting quote where he's asking, we don't all agree on when childhood begins at conception, at birth, at some point beyond babyhood. And we certainly don't agree on when it ends, it's puberty, when we leave school, when we, you know, when we leave home, when we cease to be financially dependent on our parents, and you know, when we join armed forces, when we can drive a car, when we are criminally responsible, you know, so on and so when you can get married, so on and so forth. So pretty much what we sort of argue is that everybody experiences childhood differently. And if you would reflect and ask yourself a question, mm, when did I stop being a child and when did my childhood start it? You may come to a different answers. So that's really important that childhood and children are two different things. Children are the biological human beings that we can see, but childhood is sort of something that's sort of really formed and influenced by society and culture around them. And straight from that point, we can sort of tell that if that's the case, that means that this is something quite important. And this is something that actually challenges the way how we conduct research, how we think about methodology, how we think about overall idea, how we engage with such a concept. Furthermore, Arias, who was another scholar of childhood, they sort of argue that this wasn't always apparent because apparently in medieval society, especially Western society, there was no apparent child-centered approach and children were just deemed in need of protection by the family. And that means that the structure of the family unit was very limited and children left home at a very young age and they were seen from the beginning as a, as a little adults, which is really important that they weren't children and adults, they were little adults and adults. And also there was no economy associated with children and their development. That means is that you know, the boundary and the line between the child and adult was extremely permeable. What it meant was that if there was no economy means there was no children's books, there were no children's clothing, there were no children's toys, everything was shared. So it means is the distinction that we now see, like when you walk into the mall or somewhere in Indonesia, you can buy all these children's clothes and children's books and children's toys. Well, that wasn't like that in the past. So there was no economy associated with childhood and with children. And you can suddenly start to see how something has developed and something has changed and also forming our understanding of methodological thinking. So how do we research such a concept that's been formed and developed by society and culture? The other point is that there were no services or agencies to support children compared to modernity. There was no, there was no pediatrician, there were no children's doctors, there were no agencies like social workers and other sort of groups of agencies that would be particularly looking after the health and well-being and education of children. There would be, you know, it wasn't until the late 19th century when we cemented really the public free and compulsory education, schooling and sector that's really cemented the idea how we understand children and childhood today. So we were really talking about 120, 30 years of the history of childhood. And that means is that all those toys, clothing, stories, they were non-existent in those times. So what he argues is that in medieval society, that means hundreds and hundreds, you know, in 15th, 16th, 17th century, the idea of childhood did not exist. And medieval art until the 12th century did not know childhood or did not attempt to portray it 
And that's a very good point because often when you're going to the history and if you're going to the paintings of the old times, you can see really interesting images of children or childhood that sort of helps you to understand how it was portrayed or methodologically argued. The other point that's really important to mention when we're talking about um, children and childhood is United Nations Conventions on the Rights of a Child. Every country in the world, I'm pretty sure every, apart from Somalia and United States, have signed and ratified these UN Conventions on the Rights of a Child, including Indonesia. It was passed in 1989, and it's a really foundational document that really tries to define and, and really work with the contemporary understandings of what is the child. And if you look at all the articles of that um, convention, it speaks in the convention article number one, it defines the child and his or her relationships with childhoods as a, and it claims that child is a young person under the age of 18 who has particular rights and relates to its wishes, its episteme, regardless of gender, abilities, ethnicity, or race. And that means is that this is something that really becomes a central of both philosophical and policy framework. So this is basically something where we can methodologically create a hook into, if you're researching child or childhood, this is the conceptual idea that we're researching. And you may start to make sense of what, where I'm sort of heading in this lecture, because what I'm arguing is that it doesn't really matter what kind of subject you are researching. You need to have the right methodological tools and you need to understand conceptually what you are researching. Part of the history of childhood also was about the evil, rational, and free child. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about that. There was a medieval child, and I talked about it already, that society made no distinction between children and adults in dress, work, and play. And have a look at that painting, you know, miniature adults. Those young children, they are dressed just like adults. Just the clothes are a little bit smaller, but this is the adult's clothing. There were no children's clothing. There were no dinosaurs. There were no other sort of, there were no bluey on a t-shirt and so on and so forth. So this is all linked with the Puritan discourse is what it's called. That means children as potentially evil or wicked. You know, in a, in a Christian culture, Adam and Eve or humans were born sinful. So there is the original sin. So you can see how in Western culture, the religion really is closely intervened with the way how we thought of children and childhood. For example, if child was persistently crying or failure to thrive, that was manifestations of the devil. So you can see completely different methodologies you need to employ. Lloyd de Maus, another researcher and historian of childhood, he actually argued that baptism was used to include actual exorcism of the devil. So you can see that kind of ideas that were part of that uh, th those times the idealized romantic childhood as you're hitting 18th, 19th century. You can see those dreamy images of, of 18th century, age of innocence, romantic childhood. You can see very different images of, of, of children that you can see from that period coming in. So let's look at some philosophies or theories that are underpinning this, that may help us to understand how methodologically research idea of child or childhood. So Thomas Hobbes is one of the key philosophers, he saw child as a savage beast. So often, you know, so, so Thomas Hobbes, like those Puritans that I described before, is really known for his belief that children and indeed people in general, that they were born or they sort of were innately evil. He really believed that children were born really unruly and anarchistic. And it was the parents or adults' responsibility to constrain those traits, those negative evil traits, and really to tame them, to discipline them, like you discipline some kind of beast or some kind of wild animal. And um, what he argued is that we really require a social contract uh, and organize societal authority to time or at least to keep in check that kind of savage beast in all of us. And I mean, you know, really think about our relationship with children now when children are misbehaving. We often refer to children as devilish or monster or little beasts or and with uh, we have a little understanding how we are reiterating the very same sentiment as was sort of composed by Hobbes back in 16th and early 17th century. The second thinker that can really help us with the idea of uh, <clears throat> child and childhood is really John Locke. And that means this child is empty slate, tabula rasa. You may be more familiar with this concept. So 
He's an English philo- he was an English philosopher. He was really focused on classical liberalism. So it really comes to political theory there. But but he written also the theory of mind, which is often cited as one of the really modern conceptions of identity and self. And um, he was generally proponents of that kind of theory that really flavored and favored nurture side of, side of that nature versus nurture argument that we're all familiar with. Um, when it comes to aspects of one's personality or other sort of intelligence, emotional behavior. And he had this beautiful quote in, in, in his book and where he argued that an ignorant, shameless, undisciplined child represents the failure of the adults, not of the child. So basically, first you have blame the child, adults come to help, that's helps. Now you have a log who claims, well, you know, you need to, you know, blame the um, blame the adults, not the child. And it sort of really links. And 200 years later, when when uh, Freud came, that really created that kind of clear idea about sense of guilt in parents and so on. But but most importantly, what it means is that the tabula rasa, the blank slide, the children are born with that blank slide, and we need to fulfill it. And it's parents' responsibility. Really takes the epistemological idea of of methodology to a different level. Because if you are built in without any mental content and the knowledge comes just from your experience and from your perception, that's the powerful thing. So the mind is shaped by experience, sensations, reflections. And these are the two sources of our ideal. The third sort of thinker that I wanna address today is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And that's, we're really coming to 18th century here. So children were inherently good. So see another position towards childhood, another really important ontological and epistemological position, but they become really corrupted by the evils of society. And we are all born good. That is our natural state. And it was possible to preserve the original perfect nature of the child by means of the careful control of his educational environment based on the analysis of the different physical and psychological stages through which he passed from birth to maturity. So. Rousseau saw really child as a pure, as a part of nature, innocence, and you can see how it all links and you can trace back, you know, those intellectual ears of his theories of Freudville, Montessori, Piaget, and so on. So all names that we are very familiar with, which sort of brings us in this talk to some key thoughts about children and childhood. They may form this kind of new understanding how we would like to research them. So key thought one, I will have four key thoughts and then we have four key concerns. So key thought one, so childhood studies, so this kind of thinking about childhood is an emblematic concept and it's a different lens that really incorporates multiple theories, disciplines and ideas and it incorporates both scholarship and activism. And that means it has a structural and philosophical thinking about children and childhood. And you may ask, so why does it matter for, to me? Well, it really matters because this is a really foundational thinking about what kind of methodologies you would like to utilize if your research participants or your research subjects, or if you are really doing anything with education and relates to children, having a foundational think thought about childhood studies really matters. Key thought too, childhood studies really are the new modern construct. That means is that it's really new thing that has a different demands and markets. It includes babyhood and childhood and youth. It's a structural concepts of human subjects that sort of worth investing into. Um, you need to remember that the idea of childhood historically didn't really exist. And therefore, the Western history of childhood is in a particular way the way of developing and forming and shaping and molding the idea of childhood. And the key question here is, well, what does it mean for Indonesia as a sort of colonized country that's currently is that kind of very troubling post-colonial period where you sort of try to negotiate between your local indigenous knowledge and the Western knowledge that sort of comes. Key thought three, children are often portrayed in the policies and in associated documents as vulnerable and innocent. And now you may say, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, children are vulnerable, children are innocent, and it's important to recognize that and research should be really, and our methodologies or our research should be really linked to some of those thoughts. 
Well, I would argue that some of those, sometimes those labors can be really important. For example, when you're writing to your policymaker and to your local MP or to some other person, you might sort of those words are like buzzwords and they really help to get attention and really get the media attention as well. But in reality, what they really do, that's the other argument, is they remove children's agency, their power, their decision making. Because straight away they label them as a decision made, as a vulnerable and innocent. You assign them those subjectivities, those identity positions, and straight away remove from them any kind of idea that they have a power to make a change in their own lives. So you can see how methodologically that can be really problematic. And you know, coming back to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of a Child, children's rights were ratified in Article 12, for example, clearly state that children should be consulted and they should be listened to and their voices should be taken seriously when you taking into account their voice, but are they in reality? And that's where the research comes in because methodologically, and that's what I want to talk about um, in week or two weeks, methodologically, you can make an argument how to include children's voices and children's views and children's ideas into your research. Key thought number four, through this childhood studies lens, really children and adults cannot be seen as a binary opposites. So we often like to op operate with binary opposites, like this is nature and this is culture and this is adult and this is a child and this is pretty and this is ugly. Well, things are not simply like that. There are different, there's a lot of space in between and there are a number of shades of those kind of words in between. And, and the same, way go, same things goes for children and adults. You don't become adult on a day you turn 18 because the policy tells you so. Or you don't become adult on a particular day according to something. It's, it's a process. And so we cannot see children and adults as a binary opposition. And it's really important to see that in relation to the idea of the well-being for all inhabitants of the planet. They're really thinking about it in relation to our world and to our relationship with the world around us. So that's really important. And all of these things, they form a real foundation for thinking about and, and being able to develop your conceptual and methodological framework, because you cannot develop methodological and conceptual framework in vacuum. It always happens in relationship to your research area, to your research subject. And so here I'm demonstrating to you on the understanding of child and childhood, how complex that research area is and therefore how careful you need to be when you're conceptualizing both your methodological framework, but also your key methods. So let's now move, oops, that went too far. Let's just move to some key concerns. So I talked about some key thoughts. So part of the concern is the child is not fully human, which is really sounds like something from some science fiction sort of Netflix TV series, but it's really true. Child is not fully human. Most of the ideas that we have about children and childhood is that it's all preparation for the future. So, so if if there is um, if if there is the idea that that child is uh, without education, it is wild, uncultured, untamed, animalistic human being, and and education and schooling helps child to really become educated and to many child and transition him from child to adult. Well, that that that's all fine, but the idea is that human or being an adult equals being human and it's fully in its fully developed ontologically complete human being while the child is still developing is not fully human and that's something really important that's a, one of the key points when you think of the methodology and i will come back to it in a second the second point is the child bodies under scientific scrutiny we sort of tend to think about how to put child bodies under the all research project and studies and, and how we can weigh them and measure them and, and study effects of fatigue and have a scientific developments and ideas and then to create various continuous um, models and frameworks and, and developmental ideas. And, uh, and these findings are often... <clears throat> Because, again, there is a lot of things between normal and abnormal. It's not just that. So that's, that's another key idea. The third one is the dominant framework that really positions that the rationality, universality 
a part of the child development, which means is that, you know, children are developing the same way all around the world. It doesn't matter where they are. Or for example, that you need to be really, you are not, children are not rational and they need to be adult to be rational. So these are some of the concerns of the dominant framework, including the final one, which talks about the limiting views of childhoods. So limiting views of childhoods really open up the desire for that kind of new theoretical spaces. So no longer, as I mentioned before, we talk about the binaries, child, adult, nature, culture, and, uh, and the idea of children lacked an ontological position. There's emphasis on child as a singular rather than children as a collective, which is just such a clear idea that we do need to consider that. And, and the role of state, I mean, and I know Indonesia a little bit, I know the role of the state in a child's pathway to growing up. So that's really fantastic. So that's really important to consider. Well, and then we have some challenges. So we need to rely that there are some challenges from the perspective of biology. That means is that the centrality of biology at the center of development of theories is highly problematic because if you develop that, you really are have little or no agency as social actor, as a child as a social actor within those collective societies where they exist. You know, and while the biology may tell you a lot of different things about differences between children and differences between adults, there is no necessary relationship between biological maturity and childhood and social and cultural phenomena. And this is something really important because it may be only perhaps from Western viewpoint, but the, but the lack of focus of a social world and social experience of children has really limited the potential of children and ignored their role in many communities. So that's a role of bio biology. But there's that over-determined child. So over-deterministic child means that how much role do we actually place on biology in the development of a child and how much how much how much how much weight do we put on society and culture we have argued before the role of society and culture on the idea of formation of childhood but what about you know biology and relationship with the child and i will talk in a little bit um, about the idea of uh, new sociology of childhood that really challenges and changes the way we think about these things but it's really important to understand that we cannot by bio, bio, biological idea to what childhood is really important it doesn't explain or doesn't provide a full picture hence again when we're forming our conceptual um, framework our methodological thinking around research subject we need to determine and we need to consider diverse views and diverse philosophical theoretical streams that are really forming the understanding about that given subject. The cultural bias is something really important because a lot of the theories and a lot of the thoughts that comes into methodology and comes into our understanding of the subject area is coming from different culture that we live in. It, it, it's happening in Indonesia and it's happening in New Zealand as well, that a lot of Eurocentric thoughts and Eurocentric theories and Eurocentric ideas that were tested on, on white children, we try to then extend and make sure that they are passed on as the idea for the, for the world to take as a universal truth. And uh, it doesn't take into account the cultural bias. And that's really important. So um, this has been something quite that I would really urge you to take seriously in the way that you read critical literature. And the final thing that I think it's sort of challenge number four that I think is really important is really the absence of here and now. And that's something really important because often what happens is that um, what we do generally and what, what sort of happens is that we consider that um, childhood is something that is like a waiting for the future. It's a waiting to be adult. Or well, you may remember when you were, you know, younger or a teenager and they and your parents or adults may have told you, just wait till you're adult, then you can do whatever you like. Just wait till you live on your own and you can do that. And while you're here, you can't do it. And basically, these things happen from the beginning of a childhood. 
we tell the child to go and take an extracurricular activity, to take an extra lesson in there. Some of the child says, well, I don't want to take it up. Yeah, no, I don't want to play tennis and I don't want to do an extra math tutoring. I want to go outside and play with my friends or, or I want to read this book that's already. And we tell them, no, 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 no. You need to do these things because it's really important to you and this will be very important to you in the future. When you're adult, you will understand how important it is. In other words, we're sort of carving out this space in children's lives where we are making sure and making an argument. This is something that it's not important, that it's not a time of its own right, that it's something that requires, um, that, that, that just needs to be skipped or needs to be rushed through, needs to be considered that sometime in the future, it will be extremely helpful. Plurality of childhoods, really speaking to the idea that, and this is coming to the idea when I talk about cultural bias a little bit, is that in many non-Western countries, you know, there are a lot of different ways how children develop. There are a lot of care responsibilities that children take. Uh, they are, uh, you know, toddlers take care of infants and young children can take care of um, toddlers. It's the... African babies receive three times the amount of attention than U.S. babies because they are never left alone. And uh, there are different cultural approaches to, for example, parenting. The idea that the ability to soothe yourself to sleep is important to babies' development. And it has led to that kind of sleep training in Western cultures. And, you know, you can tell me what's happening in Indonesia, but, you know, we often talk about the crying it out methods where infant is, or is left to cry till they learn how to soothe them to sleep. While in non-Western cultures, it seems that kind of technique is absolute cruel and barbaric. And I can tell you as a parent, that is cruel and barbaric. And it's very difficult to hear that. But look at the, some of the other examples of what's happening with children and childhood culturally around the world, you have a diverse cultural conceptions of how children are socialized. You know, three-year-old choirs, children know senior act as caregivers for the younger siblings. But in the UK, it's an offense to leave a child under the age of 14 years without adult supervision. You know, in the EFA community in Zaire, infants routinely use machetes with safety and some skill, although US middle-class adults often do not trust young children with knives. So there you go, some of the Barbara Rogoff's work. You know, so you can really think about this, that how this cross-cultural child development, um, really um, comparative studies will show you how children are developing differently around the world and they have different sort of um, ideas that are part of it. So, the new sociology of childhood, this is something really interesting and what I would like to emphasize is that because all of these, if you take what I just discussed, all those theories, all, the, all those ideas, all the knowledge about children and childhood, all those concerns, all those thoughts, all those challenges, you can see where I'm heading, I guess. You know, I'm heading towards the idea that, well, every research area is very complex. You know, early childhood may seem very, very, very easy to understand. But no, you're creating a new construct. You're creating a new thoughts. You need a new conceptual framework, a new methodological ideas that helps you to really understand what's happening. So, so part of the new sociology of childhood, it started in the 1980s, but, you know, it's still really valid and continuing as, a, as an area of research is, so to summarize the new sociological view on childhoods around two main areas. One is children being agents in their own life. I mean, social agents. So that means is they, they, they work and they think and they have their own agency. And they are able to contribute and they are able to participate in decision making in their lives. And that's really important. You know, this children's agency, you know, can be really reflected you know, um, in anything from children being capable and having full control and autonomy around key areas of their lives to something far weaker, such as children being recognized as being participants within their society. So um, it all creates uh, questions around the traditional idea of sociology, but basically it, it links with the agency or action and links with the structure in social life. And that's really important. 
to have those two ideas. And let's let's talk about the structure and agency for a second, because it really helps us to position the problem. The relationship between structure and agency can be very generative one. That means is that it's not just about containing the child's capacity to be active in their own decisions or changing their lives. It's also through children being really social actors and they can influence and transform society on its own. So you can see this kind of very hopeful, positive, outward thinking ideas about how to alter any structures and the rules and the regulations and the norms, values that children are being regulated and policed by generally. So it sort of brings us to this kind of thinking, well, if we are really researching field of children and childhood, who do we really see and how do we actually see this, um, and let's call it generation alpha, that means children being born after 2010. What will happen most likely for those parents is that, for those children is that, and I'm talking about the Western children mostly, but you may see some parallels with Indonesia, both parents will work, children will have fewer siblings than their parents had. They will be nearly twice as likely to be multiple of birth. Um, children will attend more childcare. They will begin school earlier and they will study for longer. They will grow up using mobile phones. Their life will closely be monitored and documented, the most likely by social media, or such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on, TikTok. Children will be activity rich and they will be time poor. Now, this is really interesting. What that means is that we will, they will have a lot of activities. They will have a lot of structure around their activities and after school activities, but they will not have enough time to develop their own thinking and ideas and govern their own space and time. One to 10 diagnosed with learning attention and disorder, 10 times more likely to be obese, a massive issue currently in Western land, but also in other parts of um, the world. Homes will be bigger, but backyards smaller than their parents. So what it means is that while the size of the houses or the space where children will live overall increases, the backyards where they're playing outside in the green areas will become smaller. So how does it link with those key thoughts of the new sociology of childhood that I mentioned just before? Um, the new sociology of childhood really identifies that the categories of child, childhood, human should be viewed as active in the construction and reconstruction of children's lives. And, uh, um, and, and that's really important. You know, the, the life of those around them and of the society within which they live. So children are not just seen as passive subjects of social structures and processes, and they employ the vari variety of modes of agency within and between the different environments they encountered and they're both shaped by. So, that, so that's an important point, but also children are being also positioned as a group inside and outside of adult society. And they are recognized as being part of this kind of complex set of systems and processes and um, both human and non-human agency. And uh, what all these children, human children have in common is their capacity really to construct alternative system of meaning outside of what it means to be adult human. So you can see where I'm sort of heading because, and, and I will really develop it in the future, but in the next lecture, but the idea that children have an agency of deforming and shaping their own world and their own ideas and their own relationship and the discourses around them really means that we need to think of a different methodologies. Because if we have a different child constructs, we will need to have a different methodologies. And especially if we consider that we need to decolonize some of those ideas about children and childhood, and we cannot really keep them as they are. And with that, I will um, stop here. Uh, and uh, and um, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Um, it's good to keep these talks crisps and, uh, and um, well, well shaped and good time. So we allow uh, plenty of discussion rather than just have a talking head. I hope this conversation has, uh, has a little bit challenged you and open up a new possibilities for thinking about children and childhoods and uh, 
possible starting points for new methodological approaches that we will further develop in a next week or in a two weeks time when we meet again. So, so that's from me the official part of the lecture, uh, Tarima Kasi, and thank you so much. Uh, and um, over to you, Ibu, Jessica. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Maritesar. It's a very uh, comprehensive explanation and it's very interesting. Uh, we learn how do we understand children and childhood and it brings up insight for me especially that we have to pay attention to children's rights and well-being because uh, we have a tend to sometimes sometimes we ignore it. We just view children as powerless object. So we have to fix it up. So we are going to the Q and A session. So for the participants, uh, like lecturers or students, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or put your questions on the chat box. Okay, the first question is from Muhammad Khairu. Thank you. Um, okay. Can you guys hear me, first of all? Yeah, it's okay. clear. Um, first of all, good, good afternoon, sir. It was a really good presentation, and we all appreciate your time being here. But there's still uh, some questions that I want to ask about what you thought for us um it was about the new social new sociology of child that you thought to us uh and it's about the children should contribute and participate more in decision making and my question is uh, where's or what's the limit for the contribution and participation participation of the children in decision making knowing that there's a certain age where human or us is physically and mentally mature to decide something and that will be my question thank you so much oh thank, thank you, you so much uh muhammad it's fantastic question really really good and really thoughtful question and uh and really excellent question and i would sort of start by saying that uh a new sociology of childhood has really provided us with this challenge to really think well well, if we think about children and childhood differently, we really do need to think about the way how they perform their participation, how they perform their agency. And uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are different, um, because as I said at the beginning, childhood and children are two different things. Childhood is a it's kind of socially and discursively constructed sort of um, idea that's sort of shaped by history and shaped by, uh, geopolitical sort of sense, while children are the biological sort of human physical beings that you can see. And your question is absolutely on money because you're saying, well, are there limits to that participation or that kind of encouragement with participation if we know that children are developing in different domains in the physical, socio-emotional um, um, language and so on. And and I would say yes and no. So it's it depends how you want to look at it. And that comes to the idea of what kind of methodological lens you're really using. Because, because the first question I would ask, if if you would be in my class or if you would, you know, be my student, I would ask you, well, try to define participation. Try to think what does it mean to participate? Because the word to participate may um may associate in a it may not be how you would expect adult to participate but let's just for sake of argument think of um, early childhood centers where there are infants and toddlers that means children under the age of three years old we know that kindergartens around the world normally are three to five three to six years old i mean you know there's a gen generic sort of position but let's talk about younger children under the age of three so those that you would really um, think of as those that would 
participate or shape their own learning or the way that they have they you would traditionally think that these young children very young children are dependent on adults to really form those activities form the um educational and other sort of ways and and they do not participate well i would invite you to come to new zealand and to visit early childhood centers or other areas where you would see how very young children are actually part of that educational process and are participating and really really are there it just comes from the very simple way how you perform their rights you invite them into play you invite them into choose what they want to do rather than choose it for them you invite them how they participate in shaping environment around them it means often about how much control we as adults we feel we need to have over the situation now part of the question is who is the boss right you can ask that question i mean of the classroom and of the environment or of that relationship it's um it's a very good it's a very good answer i mean do do you really want to have a it's 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 about sharing the power relations it's about sharing and participating and forming the environment it means sharing and letting children develop some of the own curriculum or pedagogical traits that we can then later on as adults or as a teachers utilize and implement so so there is um so 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 part of it is that no there is no limit to a participation of children in their own life or in shaping and forming the society and world around them but there is a limit on what kind of shaping and what kind of forming we are talking about so obviously we would expect different or we we we, we could expect or we could engage in different shapes and forms of participation with with 2 year olds and with 5 year olds and with 10 year olds and with 15 year olds it could be very different ways how we would engage with them but we still can encourage their participation and i would be coming back to the idea of children's rights and i was very pleased that ibu jessica picked up on one of those points that it is about children's rights of and that it is about the idea that indonesia and new zealand and all the other countries in the world have signed up for because children's rights really clearly highlight the idea how children need to and should participate in their education process in the decision making around this stuff does it mean i get often asked well does it that mean the children decide everything for themselves and they basic well it's not it's not it's that's not the case and of course they can't decide everything for themselves we need to be realistic about it but them participating from the very early age and decision making about their life and about the way they play the way they grow up the way they learn is shaping really future citizens that are democratic they are competent and confident they are really lifelong learners they are really focused on on um and they are very um active and who are really able to critically think about the world around them so that early years investment into agency and participation is really long termly shaping the future of um, of of our citizens and it's shaping the future of our countries so that would be my answer so so muhammad i thought i i i helped to answer your question um i tried i took a liberty to sort of extending it a little bit but i hope it made a little bit sense hmm. okay i guess that's um overall answered my question so thank you so much sir yes thank you Muhammad Kairulutri, for the very good questions and we have, oh, we have Bu Endah Kumala Dewi. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Uh, hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Uh, I'm Endah Kumala Dewi. I'm a lecturer in the faculty, the psychology faculty of Diponegoro University. I want to ask you, and I think I, I need your suggestion about in Indonesia, Children usually accept what their parents want, as well as in the research. In your opinion, 
what are the important factors in allowing children to be the subject of the research? What about ethics? Yes, I think that's all. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Excellent question. So, um, so basically talking about how to how to build that kind of relationship between children and adults, so it's sort of receptive from from both sides. For example, ethics or morals or other sort of areas. And uh, um, it, it's a very very good question. I think it's sort of so. In, in my lecture, I try to sort of challenge a traditional way how we sort of think about. Uh, adults children relationships and um which is which is absolutely fine but i do recognize that there is an um obviously in indonesia for example or in other countries there is a very clear idea that that there is some important knowledge and important ideas an important idea of how to behave and what, what kind of um ideal sort of uh, morals they should be passed from adults to a child and and I think I often tend to think of it as a sort of there is an um, indigenous um, concept in in New Zealand in outer New Zealand called Ako, which sort of basically refers to the um, bidirectional sort of way how learning happens. Well, what that sort of refers to that that the same way the children and young children especially, but also all the children are learning from the parents, or from adults, or from the teachers. The same way at the very same time, the learning happens also the other direction. And the parents are learning from their children, and the adults are learning from the children, the teachers are learning from the children, which makes us better teachers. So the second we sort of realize that the teaching and learning and the passing on the information goes both ways at the same time, the stronger the relationship and partnership, and we can enhance the the thoughts further. So, so for so, so for instance, the the idea you may recall how I talked about the idea of childhood, how it has changed over the period of time. How, for example, the way we thought of a childhood three hundred years ago, or hundred years ago, or even fifty years ago, it's very different how we're thinking and defining childhood now. Well, the same idea I go for ethics and for morals. The, the, what, what, what our grandparents and grand-grandparents considered to be the proper ethics and proper morals have changed because there is that idea that these things are determined and um, shaped by society and shaped by culture. So in that sense, what's been happening is that the way we, we need to look at it is that there is a, so much that we as adults, and, and I'm saying it as a father of two young children, what we can learn from them about this very important concept, as well as what we can pass on to them. And this is really important because often it comes to that kind of traditional way that as an adult, we think and we believe that we have the experience, we have the knowledge and we have right and we understand the society much better than our children. And I'm not saying it's not true. There is a lot of truth to that. But at the same time, there is a lot of knowledge and experience and ideas that we can learn from young children. And if you look at it both directions, as that ACO happens and it's bi-directional learning, that's that kind of ideal. And we see it in the families and we see it in the classrooms where the teachers allow the knowledge to be poured from children and from families into that curriculum, into the pedagogical exercise and experience. So that's the most powerful one. So 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 and and then whether it's ethics, whether it's morale, whether it's particular areas around uh, um, curriculum areas, or whether it's about STEM, or whether it's about arts, or whether it's about that, there is it's so much knowledge that already exists out there that the adults can actually access through children or through families that can really shape the way we think. So so often there are things that. Um, we, we, we can, there are, there are things that we, we can control and there are things that we can't control and there are things that we as adults, we shouldn't be really trying to control. And I think that one of the, one of the things that we've learned over the history of mankind is that no matter what we will do as adults with children, as a teachers or as a parents, 
we won't be able to control our children. They will develop and they will grow up and they will learn and in particular ways and move the generation further, their knowledge further. And what's really important, I think, for successful parenting or successful teaching is if we are on the journey with the children rather than we are against them because we do not want to constantly be creating what we what is referred in the literature as generation gap and the tensions between generations so i hope it helped to answer some of that question i mean that that's that's how that's the best how i can answer it's a very good and very complex question obviously that if, if there would be an answer to it very clear one I would write a book and sell it in a million copies. So, but I, I don't. So, mm. thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we move on to the next question, maybe from Daniel S. Sakti. Hello, Marek. Good evening from here. I know it's like 7 p.m. in all, in Auckland and um, in Indonesia, there's like um, 2 p.m., so it's still afternoon. So I'm so happy to meet you because like I know Auckland and I know uh, so much about New Zealand. It's a beautiful country like in, uh, Indonesia. And I had a uh, like, uh, study plan to go to Auckland someday, like undergraduate degree or like master degree. Maybe like, yeah, it's so good to have you here. So mm. um, I'm listening to your presentation and I'm so like, inspired got inspired from your presentation because it's so comprehensive and it's so uh, like you know precise from what is the relevance today and um i like listening about like tabula rasa and something like mm. fruit about repression and the mm. today current issues and also research mm. and my question is like okay we got knows about how childhood is how childhood is uh, developing their self to be the individual in adult life. But my question is, okay, I'm now is already uh, adulthood, adulthood, childhood, you know, like I'm not kinda in that young, I'm 20 years old and like that. So what I gonna to do like that? What what this, this like this science is uh, implemented to my life? And maybe I got to be parents, maybe I'm not, or maybe there's a lot of journey in the future. And like, I still have no idea for uh, what practice I gonna to do for this science. Mm -hmm. okay. mm. maybe, uh, maybe that's my question. Uh, da Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, salamat siang. Uh, indeed, it's a salamat malam here in, uh, in, in New Zealand. It's, it's past 8 p.m. actually. It's um, it's dark outside, and uh, and uh, so pleased that you know so much about uh, New Zealand and uh, out there in New Zealand, and you're very welcome to come. I know that the borders were unfortunately closed for a number of years, but now they're reopened, and we're welcoming students. Please do come and keep in touch. You know, and uh, it'd be fantastic to welcome you here. It's a uh, it's a beautiful country, and uh, we love Indonesian students. Uh, they are hardworking, clever. And um, I myself, I supervise a lot of uh, Indonesian PhD and master students. It's my real pleasure to to work with them. So to sort of address your question, it's it's um, it's a very difficult question because it's a very personal question. And uh, and and you say you adult, you're twenty years old. Well, you know, it depends whether you adult or not. It depends which which societal or cultural lens you take on it, which policy lens you take on it. I know I talked about United Nations Conventions on the Rights of a Child that very clearly sort of speaks in its original 1989 version about that that child is under the age of 18, but colleagues from um, sociology who are really focused on youth studies, they, they actually argue that um, that we should be rethinking about childhood and youth really extending to age of 26 or 28. We talk about the different generations, how at different times, um, but when young people are becoming parents, when they're becoming financially independent from their families and so on. So that, that's all when they are still being students. So, so all of that is sort of linked to the idea of when you're becoming adult. And, and I think that, and I think that I think mentioned it in my talk, which I think is really important. 
that um, it's not a it's it's not an easy it's not an easy decision to sort of and it sh and it shouldn't be easy decision to draw the line that this is where the childhood stops and this is where you becoming an adult. It's an uh, it's a very complex decision making, and I love to with my students in the master's class we do like the whole session on this where we try to discuss and debate. So. So what about you? When when is are you adult? Are you a child? When did your childhood stop? And, and when did it start? And everybody has a different sort of idea around it. So, so the beautiful thing about this kind of methodological approaches to childhood and adulthood is that it's formed around multiple factors that are sort of determined but but by, by various ideas. So so there is not a clear sort of idea around it. But I can tell you one thing, and, and that's for sure, is that uh, um, what's the, I, I, I like that kind of undertone of your question where you sort of are referring to the notion that, so how should I use it? What does it actually mean for me as I'm sort of going through this process? And, and I think what it means for all of us, this, this understanding of childhood, adulthood, and idea of children really, really is that um, we have an obligation to to ourselves and to a future generation of children to be really very clearly be thinking around how can we really engage and how can we make sure that children and young people are really participating in a society, that they have an agency and they have the rights to be able to express themselves and to contribute to that society. Because if you look at the... I mean, good example is to look at the, I don't know, this may sound like uh, like really something that um, that, uh, um, that, it's, that it's off topic, but it's really not. Like if you look at the city or if you look at the city where you're currently living in and how it's being planned. And if you think of any kind of city, usually between 25 to 30% population of the city are children. But if you think of how the city is planned and how it is developed and how it is administered and how it is run, that city, those streets, those areas are all built for adults, not for children. They have no say how the world around them is being shaped. The most that we do for children is we build playgrounds. And we build those playgrounds in a particular way, usually really defined by the adult's idea of safety or adult's idea of sort of reducing number of adventures and accidents. And those are the safe sort of oases of childhood when the children can develop. But it's not safe for children to be on the streets because there are a lot of motorbikes, a lot of cars, and, da, 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 da. and it's not safe for them to be there and there. And, and so if you think about the world as we do, and, and suddenly you need to think, well, what can we do as adults with this knowledge? Well, from very early age, we do need to engage children in consultation, in participation about how we define public spaces, how do we find educational experiences, how do we define the right pedagogical approaches? What do children think about the things that's happening? It's too late to be asking children when they are adults what they thought of their education. You know, often when you come to university, people ask you, oh, why are you studying what you're studying? And and you know, young students start speaking, oh well, you know, I'm studying this, I'm studying to be a teacher because when I was a, you know, I had a really bad experiences with a teacher and I thought, oh, I could do better for children, I could really improve. But Children shouldn't have a bad experiences in school to become a teacher to fix it. We should be really thinking about it straight away. So these are some of the things. So I think that there is a particular responsibility. The second you have a knowledge, there is a responsibility that you have um, in order to utilize that knowledge to try to really adjust and change the world potentially to for a better place and to really make sure that that um, that um, you engage with young people and the children and it can start through different shapes and forms and and i know it's sometimes very difficult to do especially if curriculum is um, you know is standard based and if there are particularly you know um ways what needs to be taught which day of a year and, and so 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 it's very hard to do it but it's still possible because I've seen it being done. And, and that's that's really powerful. And that's really life-changing for future generations of what can actually happen. And I see that you change your background. I, I think it's from uh, from from Zealand anyway. Um, so so I hope that sort of helps to answer some of the question. And you're, of course, very welcome to, mm -hmm. to come to New Zealand anytime. And uh, 
and I think you would really enjoy studying here or working here. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay. No, no, it's 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 from Indonesia. It's from from you know, it's Mountain Prao Law. Uh, it's all right. Um, yeah, I'm I'm submit in here like 2019, like like if I remember correct. So it's so beautiful, so so beautiful mm -hmm. submit, so beautiful meet, and it's like uh it's awarded like you know awarded or like uh, people say it like it's the 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 most beautiful summit in mm. indonesia it's it's not oh, wow. uh, so so highest so highest mountain it's like just mm -hmm. 200 and uh 2100 uh like mm. uh feet like that m a m s m like that mm -hmm. but like it's so beautiful like yeah you 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 must go there okay I certainly must. Thank you for sharing that with me. It looks so beautiful. It looks almost like something from New Zealand. I mean, wonderful. I mean, there are so many connections between Indonesia and New Zealand, and uh, beautiful nature is one of them. The other is powerful volcanoes. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, Marek, um, I want to elaborate my question. Like, yeah, sure. it's it's still have we are still have a lot of time. Like until uh, one hour next next one hour. So oh wow! Uh, first of all, okay. first of all, um, I want to I want to appreciate you. Like, uh, you are a genuine, confidence and brilliant, Marek. Like, what what I, you have so so to us, and that's something amazing, fellow. That uh, we need to figure out, you know, because there is we are our students. When there's we are our students, and there's also our lectures, our beloved lectures like, uh, Bu Cezika and Bu Endah Kumala Dewi. They are they are also so brilliant. But something we haven't now, like maybe uh, we haven't so much confidence to our our ability, right? Or our talks. We apply it to, uh, like, let's say, speak up to our, what our talks, what our problem is, you know? Mm -hmm. Because um, in Indonesia, there's, there's it's a complex society it's because we are we are so diversity, you know? And also, uh, like Bu, Bu Enda said, like, she said that uh, the parental culture is in here is, isn't so. Mm -hmm open you know like asian mm -hmm. parents like that they are so strict and they are so judgmental mm -hmm. to their child they want to their child to be perfect uh, like especially in their academic achievement but the problem is they have a lot of stereotype to their children like mm -hmm. if they go something just a little bit wrong they judge the child like you like that you like that and like maybe also some like bad words like that but it's not just the parents. It's also on the other variables in our mm -hmm. environment, mm -hmm. our community, like their friends, mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. even their teachers, and um, also um, around around of, of mm -hmm. the community. Also, like you know, even this is in social media. There's a lot like body shaming and like that in Indonesia, and mm -hmm. that's built the children to be not genuine, you know, and then the not genuine. Things it's what we what we gonna to like uh kayak, apa ya? we what we gonna to menghindari you know like that yeah I, I mm -hmm. forget to menghindari words in English but anyway um that's, to avoid. that's oh yeah apa bu bahasa Inggrisnya to avoid oh yeah to avoid the, <laughs> the not genuine things like that okay you know it's it's my bad English like that. Yeah, I hope you're not a grammar Nazi. <laughs> anyway, um, but the Junian things, um, my question is like uh, the repression. I, I, I love so much about Freud's repression theory because like what Freud's repression theory is based on in the so social things is the stereotype. So my question is about stereotype, how we need to translate the mm. stereotype and prejudice to be like, mm the powerful things, especially to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, well, well, first of all, well, thank you for that and really appreciate um, your very kind words and your thoughtful words about and reflection on your, you have a fantastic lecturers and, uh, at the great university. And it's really wonderful to see that uh, um, the work that you're doing and uh, the engagement that you have and, uh, and um, you're right, it's often difficult to to speak and to engage in, uh, sometimes in a, 
in the debate with your uh, professors or with your lecturers, but but it shouldn't be. That that's part of academia. It's it's part of really building up that um, that confidence, challenging the uh, the notions of um, of the knowledge that you receive and asking the right questions. And I think you are asking the right questions. And uh, your questions about the um, the stereotypes and the the idea around um, what, um, how to sort of change them. I, it's, it's really, really interesting because it, it's not the question of where you, it, it happens everywhere. It doesn't really matter if it's, uh, if it's uh, England or Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, you know, Singapore. There are stereotypes around uh, both education and parenting and, uh, and generally around relationship with children, and um, and the yeah and prejudice as well. You're right, and the and the idea is that how do we? Um, there is not clear. Um, there is not clear idea. You know the question. I know you're asking the right question. You know, so what do we do about them if we know that they exist and we know that they are present? How do we turn them? because um, we recognize them that they may be really hindering some progress or they may be really detrimental to some ideas of development. So how do we turn them into something that can be extremely productive or can be something that can really work in our favor? And I think that, and I have only partial sort of idea around this. I don't have fully formed answer because again, this is something that doesn't really, it doesn't really work that um, there is not one answer to to a question that would satisfy everybody, but but there is something about recognizing them, and um, and uh, there is the uh, and I would say there is there are there are two two things that I would mention. One is to recognize the stereotypes and recognize the prejudices. I, mean, I think that I know it sounds like something really basic, but it's actually really important because the problem of a lot of teaching and problem of some parenting is that. We do not actually recognize some of the stereotypes that we that we sort of perpetuate and then we sort of repeat and and, and reassure and, and further sort of utilize in, in our um, in our teaching, in our behavior, in the way how we engage with young people. So re so recognizing is, is one of the one of the key things because recognize is the first step to realize the potential for any kind of change. We can't ask for a change without actually recognizing what's happening. And the same thing also prejudice. I mean, if you recognize that there is a prejudice, that's the first step to any kind of change. And um, and so so after recognizing, the next idea would be to 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 rethink or try to sort of intentionally change some of the things. But it's impossible to change the stereotypes and change the prejudices that we have. It, it doesn't happen like that. It it happens step by it's it's it not, must be not only individual. It must be structural and societal and and sorts of steps. I and and part of it is what can happen in the classrooms. What can happen through the work with the lecturers and um, and professors at the universities, where there can be that kind of slow structural change and the other option is that it's it's up to us it's up to do always to the new generation that we're bringing and recognizing and calling them out those stereotypes and prejudices and making a difference i've been to indonesia many many times i mean most recently i've been there in august this year and remember with colleagues we were sort of counting how many times i've been there and i think it came to almost 20 i've been there and i've seen a very different um, stereotypes, very different prejudices being performed. And the same way I see them every day in New Zealand or in other sort of countries. It's, they're not that different. They, they sort of happen. But the idea of recognizing them and creating, it's, it's a first step to sort of reposition and making small changes. Sometimes small changes are more important than the big changes. Um, we often want to change everything and at the same time turn things around and believing this is the right thing. But the problem is we always need to ask, well, write according to who and according to whom lands. Because there is something, there is what I think my lecturer also tried to argue is that 
we should be really struggling with any kind of ideas that try to tell us there is a universal way how we should address particular problems in this world. So, so that would be my that would be my answer. I, I I hope I didn't disappoint because it's a very important, very big, big, um, big, big question. And um, you know, and and I do believe that there is an opportunity to really keep and to really make sure that there is that genuine potential in a way how we can recognize and reconceptualize those kind of stereotypes and prejudices. And, and sometimes we just need to work with them. And that's one of the things that this missing something um, doesn't always work. We need to acknowledge and work with that. And that's a process and it takes time. And just try to do genealogy of the own place and space where your family is from and you can see what kind of stereotypes and prejudices over the past three generations they've been and how they've worked through these things take time they're not so simple but i think starting from the very basic point and saying that children have an agency and they should be able to participate and they are part of the culture and they're forming the world as well as ours that should really um make a difference so anyway so that would be my quick answer um thank you for for that insightful question that yeah really appreciate it mm. yeah yeah thank you thank you so much Marek. thank, uh, thank you daniel thank you prof Marek, for answering the question from daniel uh, he, he is, has a high curiosity about uh, the topic Okay, we move on to the next question from Chut Dylan Salasabila. All right, am I, am, is my voice clear? Right. Okay, Perfect. okay, so um, it was really fun uh, discussion you had with Mr. Daniel back then. Uh, so yeah, I would like to also, it's it kind of like motivating to ask you and share with you some of the thoughts that I uh, mm. have. Mm. And uh, before I would like to credit Ms. Kosi for saying Ki Ora. Is that right? Kira. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello, Ki Ora. Mm. Thank mm. you for your uh, amazing mm. insights. And it was mm. really eye opening to see how there's uh, so very, there's this variety of like few about childhood throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to and like to discuss about uh, now and uh, here and now situation of like uh, the researches mm -hmm. of childhood and that is mm, about mm. Uh, what is your like true urgency of today's researches of childhood and maybe mm. I want to know your opinion about the future generations of childhood and what could be the new challenges that might appear and what how can we prepare for them thank you wow well that that's a <laughs> uh, I mean I mean I'm, I have to Was say that a lot that, uh, no, well, yes. I mean, it's it's fantastic. It's fantastic question, and uh, I think all of the questions are fantastic. I have to say, some of the best questions I ever ever received. Some of the most difficult questions also to answer. And I think you, you, you know, answer, asking that question is actually a really difficult question to sort of answer. And I think that's why you're so curious. I want to know the. I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm absolutely impressed with the with the uh, curiosity and, and knowledge that you have. I think that. The idea of here and now um, is really interesting because um, it depends when you ask me here and now. Because um, if you would ask me here and now three years ago, I would give you a different answer than I would give you today. And I think that's the that's the idea of that urgency of the current. So, I, so I'm going to divide it into two, two, two sort of answers. So one is that here and now. So. Yes, well, if you look at here and now and the idea of research, I would say that a um, month ago, I would tell you, if you would ask me one month ago, I would tell you, well, there's definitely absolute need to be researching and to really focus on the idea of children's relationship with education and, uh, and the potential damage and the um, influence that the COVID lockdowns and the online learning and the influx of education and technology that has been used without any kind of deeper knowledge or thinking around the world, what kind of impact it has on our children, especially spending so much time with children, uh, with, with their parents, or, and to thinking how parents have really become, again, the first 
educators, you know, sort of of children, and you know, so so and and understanding longitudinally how this will translate into into children's futures, and and how this generation of young children how it will be different from those that are prior and those that come in the future, hoping that we won't experience this again. And I'm saying that also not only as a researcher, as a teacher, but also I'm saying it as a parent because, you know, my, my youngest boy was born during the pandemic. So he's part of the generation. And and the other one, you know, was locked out of, of, of their uh, childcare for, for a significant amount of time. We had almost two and a half years of lockdown. So... So, so that would be one thing, and and I would be adamant that this is the most important thing that we should be really focusing on, or the most urgent thing, because if we don't capture that research pathway now, it will disappear. So there is that urgency to that. But also, very recently, I had um, as part of the research project that we conducting with uh, um, Italian Science Institute focused on. Um, geophysics and volcanoes believe or not we collaborate with them well i collaborate with them we went to kenya to africa to do some research with teachers and children it was just a couple of weeks ago and what shocked me absolutely being in that space and i've been reflecting on it quite a lot was that no one has mentioned COVID. i haven't seen one mask being worn anywhere and i suddenly realized that that these experiences that we I left so intensively in the Western world, you know, of, of restrictions and and, uh, and lockdowns and COVID, and I know Indonesia did as well because people still wear masks, as we know, you know, and still sort of part of the, you know, you can still well at least a month ago when I was there, I was still feeling of, of that kind of um, post COVID normality, and people would be talking about COVID and. There would no one for a week I've been there, no one would mention the word COVID and no one would even understand what really COVID is because in their opinion, COVID hasn't even reached that area. So so I guess what I'm trying to say is that it always, the question to be asked is always through which cultural and geographical lens you are asking that question. And what the, what's really important for me here in Auckland in New Zealand Maybe very different for 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 you in Indonesia. Maybe very different topic, and that's part of the really important um, recogni recognition of that. When, for example, students come from Indonesia to study with me from um, doing the masters or the PhD research, it's always important what research topic really matters to me, what matters to them, rather than what matters to me, because. That's really actually they have much far better and more important understanding um, what actually is, uh, is happening and what actually really matters in that culture. The other way, the second way, how I would answer, you can see that you know that answer what research is most important. I would say, well, yeah, that's important most to me. But even that idea has been challenged because of that experience. So the question is. What is the most important research? Well, the one that actually really, not only we do understand based upon the current experiences and current literature and where to research, but also where we feel we have resources to be able to conduct it. And of course, you know, from that kind of cultural and societal lens, what we can do. But the second part of the question, I want to really use that opportunity to do that. Um, that is when you talked about um, here and now, when you mentioned, and you said here and now, I know with respect to research, but, that, but I want to sort of come back to the idea of childhood of here and now, because I think that a lot of things about childhood and being a child is actually here and now. When you become an adult um, or as you grow up, you become to worry. There's a worry about the future and how what you do, how it impacts upon you. And there's a worry of choices that you need to make as well. You know, like you choose subjects, you choose education, you study at the university and you make choices and that leads to your employment and your life choices and so on. When you're a child, you're less sort of worrying about what's going to happen in one week or two weeks time. You are worried about what's going to happen in the afternoon, whether you will go out and meet with your friends. And that sort of more living in that here and now, in that kind of reality, makes some aspects of, I don't want to romanticize childhood and definitely not that, but 
it makes it a little bit different and that and it almost seems that the tension of that here and now and thinking about the future it's one of the key tensions that you can identify between how um, adults and children experience childhood while children are trying to really perform and really think about how it can stay and be here and now the most that they can and enjoy those moments of, of being part of um, those groups and the be doing that play and get really genuinely excited and 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 really you can really work in that uh in that idea that's um that's something that has genuinely really really changed in a way how adults are perceiving it because adults do believe that they want the best for a child and they want the best um what they can do for a child and what they can and and some of the things that they can do best for a child is to plan their future and to rethink that what kind of activities what kind of ideas what kind of uh extracurricular activities what who they should children be playing with and who they shouldn't and where they should go and where they should spend holidays and what's what's the best for a child and and especially if it can be translated to child's future so so that would be my sort of answer to your question and you got to get the sense that there are some things that in, in research around childhoods are very very topical and sort of happens once in a generation and creates an opportunity to research and then there are some that sort of are persistent sort of tensions that are always worth to researching because the lead and and they are both very important. So, so both of those examples that I used, the, the, the idea of COVID and how it has changed the idea of childhood and children's relationship um, and, and, and growing up and play and development is one idea. But the other then is that there's a traditional thinking about the here and now and future thinking. So, so I hope I, I answered a little bit of your answer and then thank you for saying beautifully, Kioya and... Uh, and I say Terry Makassi for a great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. I love how you answer with like a so limitless uh, answer of uh, how your opinion about my questions. And it's so amazing to see how uh, there is also a lot of other var variabilities of like um, how we could uh, different this, uh, view this differently. Thank you so much for your answer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Fabio and Salsabila. And we move on to the next question from Mentari Christi. Thank you. Um, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Mentari, and I am one of the students here. Mm -hmm. um, in your presentation before, uh, you said that parents should not uh, see their children as innocent, weak, and so on. But in reality, every culture has uh, given different thought. Uh, even people who have uh, who in different uh, in in the same culture still have different thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know your opinion mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. based on your research. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you already explained about this or mm -hmm. not, but I still want mm -hmm. to know about this. Thank you, That's and sorry part. about my. Uh, not very good English. Oh, it's excellent. Your English is ex excellent, uh, Ibu Mentari. Thank you so much for your question. It's 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 fantastic question and and it's a real great opportunity for me to clarify. So I I I I didn't say that um, children shouldn't see their that parents shouldn't see their children as innocent. I I think what I was referring to is the idea uh, the policy policy, especially the. Um, United Nations Convention's rights of a child or different other policies are perceiving children as innocent and vulnerable. So both of those sort of labels they assign to them, that means is that they are in need of protection. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think that sometimes it's extremely useful to be thinking of children as and protecting their innocence and and even calling out that they are vulnerable it can be very useful because it can be a very powerful statement that can really resonate with funders or with agencies or with other ideas um, the problem where, where it becomes really problematic is that if those words and those labels become basically a vehicle for 
removing children's agency and participation. Because if we call someone innocent and if we call someone vulnerable, we need to come and step as adults there and protect them. We want to shelter them. We want to make sure that they are, we, we call it Muslim, they are bubble wrap generation. So we bubble wrap them so they don't fall down. They never get hurt. Nothing bad happens to them. And they're going to be fully protected. I mean, of course, who, who wants a child or, or, you know, which teacher wants their children to fail or, or to be none? But at the same time, you could argue that the only way how you learn about the world is when you make a mistake. And when you make a mistake, you learn from that mistake and you sort of move on. Or you sort of may argue that till what point you're going to be considered to be innocent and when that kind of curtain is going to be removed and suddenly at the age of 18, parents open up the door and say, go, go out and, and enjoy. And, you know, it's well, it's not like that, is it? So I think that what it basically means is that the idea of innocence and vulnerability can be very useful in certain ways. It's very important to maintain those. But at the same time, innocent, um, innocent referring to child as an innocent as, um, can be really sheltering and creating a, a particular idea of a child and childhood that sort of lacks some, um, um, both some experience, but also reduces child's ability to solve their. So, so I give you an example. That's the best way. So, so imagine that you have a child, young children, and they are in a playground or in a classroom, and there's a disagreement between them, right? And and they have a disagreement, and 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 you know, children have disagreement, and they have their own understanding of events, and they have their own understanding why. And, um, you know, some teachers or some adults, they love to step in straight away and play that kind of big policeman, this kind of big parent who said what and how does it end and how do you resolve it and try to sort of, and you need to protect this child, that child didn't, you know, it's much weak. Well, that's not how it really works. Often, you know, some of the best pedagogical examples speaks about it. If there is a children's issue or children's concern or some kind of tension between children, we should let children to resolve them because they, they learned conflict resolution. They learn how to defend themselves. They learn to form their arguments. They learn how to sort of express what actually happens between them. They don't need the adult to speak for them. They don't need to involve the adults to sort of resolve those issues. And I think that often parents step in because they want to they wanna do really well. They have the best intentions that they want to step in. But I don't think it may be potentially the best for the child development, for the child's idea of their self-esteem and the way how they can resolve those problems and what they can do and what kind of agency they can have and how they can participate in the world in a way, um, in the pedagogy, in, in this kind of process to, um, to develop and to be part of it. So I'm not quite sure. Um, implementary. I hope it answered your question, that kind of idea and clarified that idea of, that, that innocence. So it's it's not necessarily about not see children as innocent. It's about that we shouldn't be really focused on that innocence, only on that innocence. But there are instances where it's really important to really make sure that children are protected and sheltered from some things. But it's always, <clears throat> but it's not, <clears throat> but often the, the problem becomes when we sort of this kind of blanket statement about um, thinking about child as innocent, and that's that modus operandi that we sort of using, in in a way how we um, how how we how educating or or supporting children. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. It's answering mm -hmm. my question. No, it was fantastic question. Fantastic question. So what what a great questions, you know? I mean, like. 40 minutes of Q&A, wow. That's an... Uh, hmm. Yeah. Is there any questions from other participants? Uh, Bu, I think that, uh, there is a question from Bu Kostri in the chat. Okay. Uh. Ya, Orat. Uh, professor, oh, oh, can you hear my you voice? Can... Oh, yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good to hear um, from your um, presentation. My question is uh, talk about children as co-researcher. 
it's probably wow. a new yeah. um a new topic yeah. especially in indonesia because we don't yeah. really think that children is part of the research yeah but we see children we do research on children about them rather than yeah. involving them as part of the research so based on your yeah. experience so how do you deal or how yeah. do you work with uh, children as your co-researchers and what needs to be developed in us as a researchers who want to involve children in our research yeah thank no, you Oh, oh, excellent question. And, and uh, it goes through. Thank you for asking that question. I, I will, <coughs> excuse me, I will, um, I will answer it a little bit, but this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about next week or in two weeks on. And so, so I don't want to say too much about it, but I will just say that this is an excellent question because what I try to do is I try to sort of in this, in this lecture, I try to sort of define some of the, um, key conceptual thoughts that sort of form the ideas based upon which we can form the new methodological thinking. And, and your thinking is absolutely correct because, and of course it is correct. I mean, it's an, it's a, you, there, there is a lot of research that happens on children and it happens with children and then it happens by children. And, um, and, and that's, that's an, um, the idea of co-researching is, is is really really important because um because i think it speaks to the idea that 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 and so, some of the questions that we had just before um they ask that question so what's the impo most important research question and some researchers would answer well it's a question that really matters to children rather than to adults and if there is if the children are part of the research design straight from the gecko and and they will be able to really understand and and really really become co-researchers and that co-researching happens on different levels in different places and in some it levels on it, it some it happens on the level what i would call of participation um that would be the co-researching and on some it levels it happens really on the level of uh co-designing research question research i'm collecting data even analysis of data all the way to publication. The children are the co-publishers of the findings and of the results. So there are really different ways how how, how we can do it. And th that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, um, then, because I think it, it requires quite a lot of discussions and examples and and and, and the work. But but you you but you can see that how, for example, the key thoughts around participation and, and agency and uh, need for different way how we relate to children and how we consider children not as not fully human but actually are part of development and how we consider here and now more than just the future these are all the key thoughts that helps us to identify how children can be co-researchers so so excellent question and um sort of a teaser for the next one hmm. Hmm. okay okay then i will make sure that you will I will have some more questions uh, next Absolutely. week about you, that. You can you can okay. challenge me on on and and present, but but that 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 I think would be would make more sense because it would make a nice sort of bridge towards yeah. it. But it's an excellent question. Thank you. Mm, Thanks, mm. Prof. Desar. Mm, thank you, thank you Ibu Jessica. What a wonderful that. questions we we've had today. I think that's an yeah. uh, what a great Q and I session. I have to say one of the best ones that I that I had in uh, years. Mm. Yeah, I think we're over time because the discussion session must be 30 minutes, but it's yeah. double. Yeah, it is. It is. Hour, it's, uh, we it definitely is, yeah. had a very long one, but but what a fantastic and highly enjoyable sort of uh, process. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Maritesa, for the insightful discussion mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. participants for the fantastic questions. Mm -hmm. Your curiosity mm -hmm. is wow. <laughs> and uh, before I close the discussion session uh professor Marquesa, is there any closing statement for us sorry i just had to find a mute button uh, <laughs> yes the only closing said the words that i have is tari makasi and really thank you for for, for 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 your generosity for having me and for really asking such a great and insightful question i think that 
the, the questions that uh, especially the students ask is a testament to the future generations of thinkers and researchers and educators that you have in your institution. And, and it's towards the future of Indonesia, per se. I mean, it's an um, over the years I've been working, I saw how the educational sector has been transforming, especially the, the university ones, and really how new and new uh, thinkers and researchers that are exposed to diversity of ideas are coming and, and entering, um, you know, education sector. And, uh, and I think that that's the future of, of, um, of, of, of education. And I'm just really grateful to be part of it and, and just really how kind of you to invite me. So, um, so time Makassi and thank you. And, uh, and for me, good night and for you, good afternoon, I guess. Mm. Yeah, in Indonesia in Sumatra. Okay, thank you, Professor Maritesa, for uh, your to sharing your expertise with us. We are really honored to have you here, and we learn a lot of knowledge from you. And now maybe I will go in uh, Ibu Endah Kumaldiri. Endah, the time is yours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Malik Desha, we thank you for inspiring the presentation. This is the certificate of our appreciation for your expertise. We hope we do have that somebody, someday we will be able to see the future research of yours with another theme, not less interesting than the first one. Thank you so much. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you so much, Buenda. And maybe we can uh, close the lecture today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Mark Tessar. Thank you, all the lecturers and students. Thank you for the very interesting and uh, interactive discussion. Uh, we are very happy to have Professor Mark Tessar here. And thank you. Thank you so Stay much. Happy. Terima kasih. Yeah, See you next week. See you next week, Professor. Marek. Thank you, Bufio. See you next week. Terima kasih, week. Professor. Terima kasih. Bye. 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 Terima kasih ya semuanya. Terima kasih Bu Enda, Bu Jessica. Terima kasih mahasiswa. Terima kasih Bufio. Adik-adik semua. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Bu.